Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Welcome to this episode of Back Garden Biology and it's an incredibly hot sunny day in a very very dry month of May and I'm sure you're finding the same in your garden having to do a lot of watering and so on. For the first time this episode is going to be centred on birds. I've kind of avoided that because it's very difficult to take good footage of birds unless you've really got a good camera and which I don't really have um, but I was able through the very kind uh, agreement of some of my colleagues to borrow some footage so you're going to see a mixture of footage some of it is sort of fairly poor quality and that's my footage taken in my garden but also some much better close-up shots and they've been taken by colleagues in the zoology department who work up at Whiteham Woods and Whiteham Woods is really famous for the stuff Study of great tits and blue tits. So they've been monitoring both great tits and blue tits at Whiteham for about 60 years and that makes it one of the longest running uh, ecological studies in the country, possibly even the world. Now I was inspired by that because I put up a nest box in my garden as I'm sure many of you have done. If we just pan over behind me we can hopefully see it. So that is a brand new nest box that I was given for as a Christmas present and uh, we decided to put that up just the day after lockdown. And to be honest, we thought we're probably going to be too late to, to have anything use it this year. But within 24 hours of putting that nest box up, a pair of blue tits arrived and started checking it out, which we were really delighted about. And in fact, they've just finished and all left. There's no, nothing, no sound coming from there anymore. So I want to just talk you through what is the nesting behaviour of the blue tits? How long does it take? Um, what do they do? How many eggs do they lay? And then we're going to look at some of that in a bit more detail. So it begins in about February for blue tits. They start looking for nest sites. Obviously our two had not been very successful, hadn't really found anywhere that they liked that much. And that's why they were prepared to wait till a bit later. And as soon as they saw that, they were in there. Now the female alone will first start to build the nest. She's not gonna just lay her eggs into the bottom of that box. And she collects moss to do that. So we saw her actually in the lawn pulling up moss and bringing it back. And blue tits make, you know, as all animals, are sort of individuals. They don't all make an identical nest. Some of them build a thick layer of moss with just a few feathers on the top. Some of them have a thinner layer of moss with a great big carpet of feathers on the top. But blue tits are very fond of feathers for the tops of their nests. Uh, and those examples were from Whiteham where the, the, the researchers are going in and they're having to monitor the nest very closely. Now that takes the female blue tit about two weeks and she probably won't get any help from the male in doing it. And once she's happy with that nest and she's got it built, she starts to lay her eggs. And she will lay one egg every day until she has her clutch. And only then will she start to incubate the eggs. And to do that, she'll actually t she'll strip off some of the feathers from her belly so she can press her bare skin against the eggs and transfer warmth to them. And then she has to incubate them for around two weeks. And when that process is finished, out will emerge these tiny sort of pink helpless chicks that look a bit ugly, to be honest, like a little newborn mouse or something. Very helpless, obviously needing a lot of help from the parents. And that's when we really started to notice them because then we realised that the two parents have to work like crazy. Each one of those chicks can eat up to 100 caterpillars a day in order to grow as fast as they need to. So both parents are backwards and forwards, in and out of the box, to the point where sometimes one parent would arrive as the other one was leaving and have to sort of bounce off in midair before it could even get in and feed them. So you see how hard they are working. And in fact, it's been estimated that birds who are rearing chicks are working as hard as a Tour de France cyclist. So it's the equivalent of doing the Tour de France as a human if you're a bird trying to, to raise offspring. It's hugely energetically demanding. 
Now, what you may have noticed, irrespective of whether you actually have a nest box in your garden, is there's a period of time for about a week when blue tits seem to be launching themselves at the windows of your house. And I managed to film this one in the front of my house when I was actually staking out the sparrows last week. And you can see them going all around the windows and behind the drain pipes, and they are looking for spiders. And people have always noticed this about tits, blue tits and great tits, that they start feeding chicks spiders at a critical period. And they wondered why. And someone did a really nice study to investigate it. So proteins, which are the molecules that are the building blocks of all organisms, are made up of things called amino acids. And there are 20 different ones. And some of them are harder to obtain than others. And spiders are peculiarly rich in a particular amino acid. And so somebody did a study where they gave blue tit chicks a supplement which contained this amino acid to see what impact did it have. And it affected their behaviour the once the chicks fledged and were older. So it made them bolder and more inquisitive and investigative. So that behaviour of looking for spiders is really kind of to, to protect the mental development, if you like, of their chicks. Now, once the chicks are about 14 weeks old, they look like this. Sorry, 14 days old. Just two weeks later, they look like this. You can see they've got lots of feathers on them. They're nearly ready to go. And then the parents change their behaviour a bit. And when they arrive at the box, as you can see here, they start shouting at them quite a lot, like this. And that's that kind of aggressive shouting, get out of that box, you know, you need to fledge. We need to get out of here so I can start feeding you properly. Uh, and they will keep feeding the chicks. The parents will stay with them. I don't know quite where they've gone. I don't see them around the garden now. Uh, but they will continue to look after them for another few weeks. That's the pinch point for blue tit chicks. The young ones, are they going to make it? They've got to fatten up. They've got to make it through the winter. Of course, most of them won't because a lot of chicks um, are born every year. So the blue tit average clutch size is about seven, but it can be a lot more. And that's the thing that we're going to look at in a lot more detail today. Why? is it that um, different birds have different sizes of clutch and what factors determines that? So I've got through, I made three little helpers here, the great tits, not blue tits, because more of the work that I'm going to talk about has actually been done with great tits rather than blue tits. It wasn't that I didn't have any blue play-doh, honestly. Um, we're going to think about a life history trait and a life history trait is a characteristic of a species that's not a physical characteristic. So a physical characteristic might be something like wing length or beak length. Uh, but a life history trait is something to do with the way the bird lives its life. So it might be how long it lives. Lifespan is a life history trait. Uh, or it might be the number of eggs that it lays. Or it might be how much care it then gives to those to the chicks when they hatch. Those are all examples of life history traits. And whether traits are physical or whether they're life history traits, we believe as ecologists and evolutionary biologists that all those traits are under natural selection. And natural selection is a force that shapes organisms. And it doesn't just shape the way they look, but it also shapes the way they behave. And in order to understand that a little bit better, what natural selection is and how it works, we're going to hear a little bit from Professor Stuart West, who is a professor of evolutionary biology in the Department of Zoology here in Oxford. The theory of natural selection is Darwin's greatest contribution to science, and it follows from just three simple ingredients. First of those is variation, and all that means is that within a population of something, you see variation. So for example, if you're looking at giraffes, some might have longer necks, some might have shorter necks. The second ingredient it needs is heritability. And what that means is that offspring are like parents. So to go back to the giraffe example, giraffes with longer necks have offspring with longer necks. Their babies will have bigger necks. Now the third thing, the slightly more complicated thing, is that you need differential success or differential fitness limited to that, uh, linked to that variation. And what that means is that individuals that are different that have vary in their ability to survive and reproduce. So again, if we go back to the giraffe example, what we might find is that giraffes with longer necks are better at reaching up at trees, they get more food, they're able to have offspring more successfully. So they end up having more offspring than giraffes with shorter necks. And evolutionary biology, we sort of lump all these things that link your ability to survive and reproduce into a term called fitness. So this might be ability to catch food, evade predators, anything like that. 
Okay, so now we've found out a little bit more about natural selection and how it tends to maximise something called fitness, which we can say is probably best approximated by the number of grandchildren that an organism has. Now let's have a look at our birds because something exciting has happened to them since we last saw them. All three of them have built nests, look, and they've all got uh, five eggs in them. I want you to imagine that five is the standard number of eggs that a great tit lays. I don't think it is in reality, it's more like seven, but I couldn't fit seven eggs into my little nests. Now what we're going to do is to try to understand if five is the average that we observe, is that actually the clutch size that will maximise their fitness? And one way we can test that is to change the number of eggs that the birds have by adding extra ones. So I could go to another bird's nest and I could give this bird one extra egg. And similarly for this bird, I could perhaps give it two extra eggs and then I could allow it to rear those extra eggs and see how many chicks does it successfully rear. And when people do things like this with birds, they tend to find that they are able to rear more chicks than they would have been able They are able to rear those extra chicks. So it looks like their fitness could actually be higher if they laid more eggs, which of course raises the question then why don't they lay more eggs? And one of the criticisms of those studies is that it hasn't taken into account properly of all of the costs of egg laying. So if you just give a bird an egg that some other bird has laid, then they haven't paid the full costs of it because they didn't have to manufacture the egg and perhaps they didn't incubate it for quite as long. The other thing that we haven't taken account of is that birds don't just live for one year. The females might survive the winter, they have a reasonable chance of doing that, and they might have a higher chance of doing that if they didn't have a very large number of eggs, because the bigger the clutch, the more food they have to find, the more tired they're going to be, the more run down they're going to get. So we have to think about the future offspring as well and whether they're being compromised. So one way of doing this was a really nice study that did this instead. So they again started off with three different treatments. So they had their control birds which would be laying exactly five eggs. Then they found other birds who had clutches of five and they manipulated them in the following way. So to some of them they simply gave them two free eggs. So this one gets free eggs, she didn't have to lay them but she has got to incubate them and rear them. For another one, they decide, well, maybe a lot of the costs come from the actual incubation. Uh, that, after all, is quite costly for the bird. So they'll at this one, they didn't get free eggs, they actually got free chicks. So they waited for the eggs to actually hatch and then transferred two newborn chicks. I'm going to sort of put them on the side there. So she's also going to have two extra, but she got them as chicks rather than as eggs. And then finally, this one is going to have the toughest treatment. So what they actually did was to remove some eggs from the nest, okay? And if you remove eggs from a great tit nest, they will lay more. So she lays a couple of extra eggs. And then we put these ones back, all right? And now this one has the same clutch size as this one. Oh would have done if my egg hadn't rolled off. I'll just try and replace it. All right, so she's got the same as that one, but those ones came for free and this one had to pay the full cost of those eggs because she had to actually lay them. And when they then calculated the number of surviving offspring and how well all these birds did, these ones definitely had lower fitness. That means that if, you, if they're really forced to pay the full cost of all of those extra eggs, then it really does have fitness consequences. And those fitness consequences came in part because the females didn't survive as well till the following year, but also in part because if you give great tits extra chicks, they don't actually survive as well because the larger the brood size, the smaller the chicks are. So it looks like they've got more chicks, but actually they don't actually survive quite as well. So some pretty clever stuff. It's all done very carefully by trained researchers who know how to handle the birds and the eggs and know how much stress the birds can manage. Uh, don't try anything like this at home for goodness sake. Right, well, let's end this where we began, down at the back of the garden, looking at my empty nest, empty nest box anyway. So my blue tits have gone off 
and I hope that those young are still alive out there and being fed by their parents. I hope this doesn't happen to them. This was footage taken by my uncle. A sparrowhawk arrived in his garden just literally a few days ago and found the blackbird's nest and came back and ate one blackbird nestling after another. I'm afraid that is what raptors do. Once they find the nest, they're not going to leave any of them behind. However, we can at least say that the sparrowhawk is a natural predator and it does have its own chicks to feed. I would plead with you, if you have a cat, to think about the damage that cats cause. They are the, source of the biggest source of mortality for a lot of blue and great tit chicks in gardens. Um, of course people want to keep cats and they are lovely animals, but there are things you can do to limit the damage they cause, like making sure that they have a bell and also actually not letting them wander around at night, where obviously that's not when they tend to eat blue tits, but they do cause a lot of damage to frogs and small mammals at that time. Well, I hope in your garden this week you can maybe see some of these newly fledged blue tit and great tit chicks feeding and, and moving around the garden and finding food for themselves. And uh, we'll see you next time on Back Garden Biology.